on us. Four takeaways, one, what a brain buster. But really, there was a time when none of us knew how to subtract, and we had to be taught as well. And there may have even been a time where you were in tears because your father took your calculator <coughs> away. And you were in tears because it's so hard, I'm never going to learn. Math is so difficult. Dad! He's six, by the way. <laughs> so after some tears, and after a practical lesson, I got him to get me four pairs of his underwear, and I took one away and asked him how many pairs of underwear he had left. <laughs> and he said, three! Oh, that's easy! <laughs> and move on. Perseverance is not something that comes naturally, is it? It's not something that we're born with. Yeah, it's hard. Yes, I get to learn something. No. <laughs> Oh, it's hard. I can't stand it. I want to be done with it. I want to move on. That's why Paul opens up with this. Therefore, we do not give up. And he writes that because he just finished writing. Uh, I read a bit of it. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. God's grace extends to us. That's from verse 13 and 14 in, in chapter 4. God's grace extends to us through his offer of eternal salvation in Jesus. We don't give up because we know something better is coming. We have hope. We have hope. Being hopeless, not so much fun, easy to give up. But we have hope that something better is coming. Uh, and why? Uh, yeah, because something better is coming. Sorry. So there it is. Easy peasy. Don't give up. Sermon's done. Let's go home and eat. Right? No, the passage keeps going. So we're going to keep reading. Therefore, we do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed. Though outwardly destroyed, even though our outer person is being destroyed, not giving up easy is easy when the things are going well, but what about when things start breaking down? Now, kids, I know that you guys can't imagine that you're going to be an adult one day. It's taking forever. Man, you, you know that second hand of the clock in school just takes forever to hit 320 or 3 o'clock or whatever, 255, whatever it is in your school, right? It almost goes backwards. And you're like, when am I going to get my license? When am I going to be 18? When do I get my first job? When can I? I understand. But pretty soon, you're going to be 42 and broken down and maybe talking to your church. <laughs> it's going to happen. Older folks, do you remember what it was when you realized you weren't 20 anymore? <laughs> right? You know the saying, the things that, uh, that work hurt and the things that don't work? Don't hurt. <laughs> uh, soon enough, you'll be beat up like this old guy. You never know. But our bodies uh, don't last. They do break down. We have a shelf life. And we're all, we're all aware of that. That's, uh, that's something that just happens. Uh, life is hard on us. So I, I played volleyball a lot in, in high school. I don't know if we have any volleyball players here, but I played middle. And... Uh, the thing about being in the middle is when you're on the defensive side or the ball's on the other side, you have to watch where the ball goes and go to where, block where the ball is going to go, where it's going to get hit. So it was an early morning practice at Downley High School, uh, and I was in grade 11, and the ball goes high outside, so I skirt over to the outside, I go up for the block, I press in, get the block, my, and my mind is on that ball, on that block, not hitting the net, pressing in, get it, yes! And I land, not thinking about where my foot is in time and space. My foot wasn't straight, it was just in a little bit. And I landed, pop, 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 pop. And uh, I was on the ground in shock. You guys know that shocky feeling. Some of you do. Yeah, you just feel like really nauseous and everything is kind of fuzzy around you. Uh, every step that they carried me to my parents' van to take me to the hospital, I could feel my ankle go in and out, in and out, in and out. And so they put me in a cast, and that's how I spent the rest of my volleyball season. Uh, I was black and blue up to my knees, and later when I saw my surgeon, uh, when the cast came off, he said, you have grandma ankles. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I love my grandma, by the way. <laughs> but I didn't want her ankles. Uh, and that's what kind of pushed me forward. You know, physio, no one gets physio in, in the 90s. And that's kind of what ended me up on this road. But I, I've thought about this lots in the last couple of years, and camp has been difficult when you can't really walk well, and you can't stand for long periods of time. It's tough being a camp director. But uh, we're not supposed to give up. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, 
Our inner person is being renewed day by day. Well, who wants to be renewed? Probably all of us. Man, God, renew my heart. Right? A lot of, a lot of people play, pray for revival and renewal. But I think we forget what the process of renewal is like. So I, I love, like, restoration shows. My wife and I watch Flip or Flop. Right? Yeah? You guys seen that? Or Amer American Restoration, that was on for a while. Or American Pickers has some restoration on it, too. It's really cool. Love It or List It, that's a good Canadian one. Yeah, they do some restoration on homes. Uh, one of my favorite things is this YouTube channel where he takes like hand tools like this plane mm. and then he works on them and he restores them to this. Ba -ba -ba. Right? Mm. And this next one, this, this is like a rebar cutter yeah. and like you don't even recognize it. Uh, my mechanics, you can look it up on YouTube. There's no dialogue, he's Swiss and so he's very particular. It's super good. <laughs> you gotta check it out. Uh, that's good enough, Tim. But, uh, and it feels good to see, man, that's satisfying seeing things get renewed like that. But what happened in between those two pictures? A lot of sanding, sandblasting, right? A lot of taking off the hard edges, a lot of scrubbing and dirt removal. And that was hard for the person that did it. But uh, could you imagine being the person that's being renewed? How painful that would be. Our outer person is being destroyed. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. Man, I want to be renewed, but I don't want it to hurt. And I don't think any of us want the hurt and the pain that comes with renewal. And I know that part of the Christian walk is that suffering, is that pain, is God taking off those hard edges so that our character can grow. Years ago, someone told me, and I don't know who, whose quote this is, that we need to change. We need character. Character is always preceded by change. But change is always preceded by challenge. We don't change unless it's difficult. And we need that. And God, our Father, our good Father, knows that. We need to be renewed. We need to be restored. We want renewal, but it hurts. Uh, for, uh, let's read that again. Therefore, we do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing. Our momentary light affliction is producing. Our affliction is productive. Can our worldly struggles be productive? It feels like the opposite. It feels like our struggle, struggles stop us from getting things done, not enhance us to be more productive. Uh, I had an interesting con uh, conversation with my neighbors. They're not believers, they're atheists. And we've had many conversations over the years. And so his, uh, his father was on death's door. And I was talking with his wife. And I said, to, she was saying, it's just so tough because he's in pain. And it's hard on us. And we're getting older. And I just don't know. And I said to her, look, you know that that can be redeemed. <coughs> Something good can come out of pain. She said, no. Pain is bad, suffering is bad, and it should have no part of our lives. And if that was, if that was your attitude, you'd have, to, you'd have to mentally detach yourself to be satisfied at any point in your life. Because a human experience will always involve suffering. We live in a broken world. Man, if, if that was, like I said, our bodies are broken. And, and pain is a part of the human experience, full stop. And there's some bad teaching out there that when you follow Jesus, things get easier. That you won't be in as much pain. But I haven't found, have you guys found that? How would you grow? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I would say the Christian life's better. For sure it's better. But is it easier? I, I, I really, like, and there's nothing wrong with saying, God, please deliver, deliver me from this trial. It's hard. We need to pour out our lives to God. But to come forth to him, expecting that he will deliver us from any, any sort of hardship, Folks, it's just not going to happen. And you know how I know it's not going to happen? Because his own son said, I don't want to do this. Is there another way? But I'll accept it if there's not. If God is not willing to spare his son for the good of mankind, but is able to sustain him and make something beautiful out of it, your momentary light affliction can be production, can be productive. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. That's a lot of superlatives, right? Absolutely. 
Incomparable, eternal weight of glory. Light affliction, eternal weight. You like that comparison? I think of like Adrian versus me, right? This is, this is like more like eternal weight over here, and I might be a little heavier than him. I try to compare someone lighter with me, like my six-year-old son maybe, uh, super light. Uh, the eternal weight of glory. Whenever I think of weight, it doesn't really get spoken of in, in a positive term like that, right? Oh, I've got this huge weight on my shoulders. But that's the way that Paul refers to it here. Eternal weight of glory. Uh, this glory doesn't mean that we're glorified, but it means that we get to take part in the eternal glory of fellowship with, with Jesus, with God in heaven. You know, maybe we should read Revelation 21. Just to, There's a lot of different verses in Revelation about what heaven's like, and they all give us a picture. None of them tell us exactly what it's going to look like, or, but there's some good comparisons there, some good pictures for us. Revelation 21, 4 to 7. And this is John that writes this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one on the seat, on, seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. It's going to be good. We don't even know the half of it. And not suffering will be great. Fellowship with God will be great. I would give you a good example or a good illustration of how amazing it's going to be, but by definition I can't. Absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. None of us even have a sniff of what eternity is going to be like. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. You know, pain and suffering is going to happen in our lives, but the difference is that when you put your faith in Jesus, something can be accomplished through it. If you don't put your faith in Jesus, there's a very small chance that something positive will come out of it. And I know that we started with some people that encountered hardship and they went on to be successful. But when all, all of us are moved on to the next life, when all the debts are called in, how much is Disney going to matter? How much, I, Mulan's a great movie, <laughs> but in the scope of eternity, how important are Disney movies or the Disney Channel? Not really at all. How much, I mean, I, I, I owned two Honda motorbikes and really enjoyed them a lot. I owned a Honda, I owned an Acura car. They're great vehicles, but when life's over, how much are those things going to matter? Probably not much. And those trials produce something in those people's lives. But our trials produce something that you can't even, that doesn't even, it's not even on the same plane. Um, when I was obsessed with motorbikes when we first got married, or dating, uh, on my wife's birthday, when she turned uh, 20, we may have gone out and bought a motorbike together. <laughs> that was her birthday gift. She had such, you remember when our wives had good attitudes before we were married, right? <laughs> sure, we'll do that. Oh, man. They still do, they still do. Uh, but, but anyhow. Uh, I was obsessed with getting a motorbike. I had to sell that one to go to Briarcrest uh, so I could do what I do now. And uh, so I sold that motorbike. And I remember walking to school just fantasizing about, oh, I just need another motorbike. I can't wait. And I would talk about it way too much. And my wife was becoming concerned about that. This is when we were not even married a year. And I said, don't worry, honey. You're more important than motorbikes. And she's like, I'm on the same plane as motorbikes? <laughs> In the same way. The trials of this life aren't even on the same plane as, as what is coming. No. We don't have a sniff, but we're told here, and it's trustworthy. So if that's the case, what needs to happen differently? For a momentary light affliction is producing us an inco absolutely incomparable, incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. So we focus on not on what is seen. How do you focus on something you can't see? I'm getting like a, a martial artist vibe, right? When you put, the, uh, you put the blindfold on and then they fight, and then all of a sudden you can see the person you can't see. That doesn't work, right? No one can focus on something they don't see. When you go to an eye exam, you don't close your eyes 
and then tell them what's on the chart. Because <laughs> you can't see it. It doesn't make sense. Paul says, so we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. That's a, that's a real trouble. Uh, when I learned how to drive, our, my driving instructor taught me that humans are used to moving at a max of 30 kilometers an hour, but really most of the time we're moving at like three miles an hour, four miles an hour walking at a brisk, brisk pace. And so we look in front of us because we don't want to trip on anything. And especially with someone with bad joints, I look in front of me because I don't want to fall into a hole and twist my other ankle, and you're all messed up, right? That's happened to me before, it's not fun. Uh, but when we walk, we look in front of us. My driver's instructor said, a cheetah will look closer to the horizon because they move so quickly. So when you drive, drive like a cheetah. Not super fast, but look in the distance. <laughs> because you will end up where because you'll end up when you're looking where you're looking. If you look in front of your vehicle, you won't drive straight, you'll weave. And it, he told me that because I was not driving straight. We always, as humans, tend to focus in front of our feet. And how true is that of our life priorities as well? I'm gonna play a quick video by Francis Chan. And uh, he can say it better than I can, and then I'm going to give some closing thoughts. So how do we play that? You got that right there, Tim? Imagine this rope. Okay, pretend this rope just goes on forever. Okay? Just imagination. Pretend it goes around the world a few times, doesn't it? Ends at the rock. But uh, let's just imagine this thing goes on forever. Now imagine that this rope is a timeline of your existence. You just exist forever. You see this red part? This would represent your time on Earth. You've got a few short years here on Earth, and then you've got all of eternity somewhere else. This is, this is your existence. And what blows me away is some of you, all you think about is this red part. It's all you think about. You're consumed with this. You go, oh man, I can't wait till here. You know, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save, save, save so I can really enjoy this part right here. <laughs> and you're consumed with that. You think, oh man, I'm going to get to travel. Am I going to eat well? Am I going to do this during this part? I'm like, are you kidding me? What about this? What about this? What about that? What about all this stuff? It's, just, it's crazy to me because, because the Bible teaches that what I do during this little red part determines how I'm going to exist for millions and millions and millions of years forever. And, and so why would I spend this little red part trying to make myself as comfortable as possible, enjoying myself as much as I can, Paul says, look, I'm going to live my life for this mission. I'm going to spend my life, invest my life for this moment when I cross that finish line. See, I'm going to forget about all this stuff I could enjoy. And I'm not going to look around. I'm going to be like a runner just looking at that moment when I face God. Because when I face Him, then I don't get this chance over again. We get one chance at this life on earth. And it can end at any second for any of us. We've got one chance at this, and then comes eternity. And I'm not going to be fooled. I'm not going to spend my life down here. See, people look at some of my decisions and go, oh, you're so stupid because that's going to really affect this. I go, no, you're stupid because that's going to affect all of this. <laughs> Man, I, I, I'm serious. I, I look. I look at the way people live and I go, wow, that is so crazy. You are so crazy. You're going to, you're going to do that right now, just to enjoy it right now, not even knowing if you have tomorrow, and you think that's smart and that I'm dumb, it doesn't make any sense. Paul goes, I'm not going to look around at all this stuff. And it's tempting. It's tempting to all of us. That's what I'm saying down here. It's crazy because everyone lives that way. Everyone lives for the red part. No one's thinking about the millions of years afterwards. It's, it's just this crazy deception that we can't get out of our minds. And Paul goes, I'm not doing that. He goes, I keep my eyes on that. I keep my eyes on that finish line, and I'm going to forget what's behind me. I'm not looking around. I'm just going to, I'm straining. He goes, I'm straining forward. I'm like stretching forward for that mark. I'm going to pass this thing. I'm going to live this out, and I'm going to face him. I'm going to come before the judges, and he's going to hand me that trophy. 
He goes, I'm going to get it. And I haven't gotten there yet. He goes, but you, you better believe I'm using every muscle, exerting every bit about me because I'm going to pass that line well. Imagine this rope. Pretty crazy. I, uh, it's easy for me not to think that way regularly, to think about what's before me. And if I have to be honest with you, my, my biggest struggles with my pin my foot has to do with what is immediate and not what is eventually impending that we will all meet, which is eternity. Uh, that's what Paul's talking about here. When we face trials, when we face struggles, when we think about how difficult our life is going to be, and when we focus on that, we, we are robbing the ability of that to be eternally significant. But when we think about the Lord God, and when, when we think about how he's setting up things up for eternity, that's when our sufferings, that's when our sufferings will be brought into perspective. Our temporary sufferings, our temporary trials, can produce eternal glory. I don't know your trials. I don't know, I'm sure they're difficult. I'm positive there are some things that you, the people in this congregation are dealing with that are very difficult. And I can't minimize that. But like I said earlier, there's someone who's experienced even more heartache than all of us. And his eyes were on eternity. And he didn't have to act. We, we need to commit our trials to the Lord and to think about them in the light of eternity. Our temporary trials produce eternal glory. Let's pray. Lord God, thanks so much for your word. And please, Lord, would you meet us in our trials, and would you help us to focus on your son, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.